Yeah, thanks for, uh, for having me here. Um, I'm excited to tell you about some of my work, um, which hopefully will be, have some relevance to your, your upcoming hackathon. I'm going to tell you about a topic that a lot of people have been thinking about. Uh, so I'll give you kind of my, my corner, my take on the field of how classical and quantum computers can work together to solve problems. Um, and I think it opens up a lot of, a lot of interesting design space. Um, and I think could have some fun um, hackathon possibilities as well. So the, the overall theme is that uh, quantum computers are coming. We, we hope. We hope they're going to be big and do useful things. Um, but no matter how successful they are, they are not going to be, you know, classical computers are never going to go away. Uh, classical computers will always be cheaper than quantum computers because if you just have to correct bit flip errors, it's a lot cheaper than correcting bit flip and phase errors. So whatever the platform is, it, it's hard to imagine that changing. Uh, and so the computing in the near term and the long term is going to involve some use of quantum and some use of classical computers. And so that means that when we think about algorithms, we should think about algorithms that make use of both of these platforms. And a, an example of a, you know, a hybrid computing platform that I like came after, I mean, this, the idea was around before, but it was, it was popularized more after Gary Kasparov lost to Deep Blue uh, in the mid-90s. Then uh, he helped promote this idea of hybrid or centaur chess, where there's a human and a computer that play together. And there was this nice window when the hybrid teams had a higher chess rating. You know, computers were above humans, but the hybrid teams were above even computers playing alone. Unfortunately, uh, that's no longer true. Now computers are just, uh, you know, humans don't add much value to the computers. But there was a time when the, the capabilities of both complemented each other. And what I'm looking for is when did this happen for classical and quantum computers? The capabilities of, of each platform provide something that the other one can't. Um, and I'll talk about two, uh, two examples of this. Um, one of them is kind of the main use of hybrid quantum algorithms, but I'll, I'll talk about a few questions within it that I think are interesting. And one is something that uh, hasn't been as widely looked at, but I think also has some promise. So the two problems I want to talk about, the first one is uh, variational eigenvalue estimation, goes by the names of VQE and QAOA. Uh, and in this, you are basically, you have a variational onsat, you're tuning some parameters to try to find the lowest eigenvalue of some giant matrix either corresponding to a combinatorial optimization problem or to an interacting quantum Hamiltonian. And so it's, in general, these are hard problems, NP complete or QMA complete, um, but you know, we still want a heuristic algorithm. We want to do the best we can. Um, and this is a hybrid algorithm because the quantum computer is evaluating the onsets and the classical computer is doing the outer loop, you know, performing the steps of gradient descent or uh, whatever your outer loop of the optimization problem. So the classical computer is good at doing the arithmetic needed for gradient descent, uh, keeping track of where you are. You can kind of remember where you are, it doesn't be cool here. Whereas the quantum computer, the advantage is that it, can, it has a, access to a family of models that cannot be evaluated classically. So the models used, the onsets is used, are ones where classically we don't know how to evaluate them. Otherwise, you wouldn't need the quantum computer. So it, it, it extends the range of models that, that a classical computer could use. The other problem I want to talk about is uh, optimization or sampling problems that involve large data sets. Uh, and quantum computers do not do well with large data sets. And so this is a different strength of classical computers. You can access, you know, you can easily have a, a hard drive with terabytes of information uh, with random access, and that's, that's not too hard. Uh, and if you have a quantum algorithm that, say, has some advantage in search or sampling or, or optimization, how can you combine that with, with a, a large classical data set? Uh, I'll talk about that. Uh, I'll talk about that in the second part of my talk. Okay. So these are the two themes of how classical and quantum computers can work together. Um, I'll talk about what we know about them, but there are more open. There are more things we don't know about them. And I think so. A lot of room. A lot of things for you to try out uh, in in this hackathon. So let me talk first about variational algorithms. This is work I did with my uh, former grad student John Knapp. 
Variational algorithms, when people talk about NISC quantum computing, sort of near term, almost everything they're doing on these NISC devices is, is basically this variational algorithm. And it always looks like this. You have some H, which is a matrix, which re reflects the thing you're trying to optimize. And you're trying to find a state psi that minimizes this quantity. And you, you know, there are a lot of state psi and exponentially num number of parameters. You can't search over all of them. Instead, you pick some parameterized family. So if T1 through TP are your parameters, and A1 through AP are some, some matrices, then this gives you some uh, parameterized family. You have a state psi that's a function of this vector T. And there are a few choices of this. So QAOA uh, is an algorithm proposed for combinatorial optimization, meaning that you're trying to optimize some, uh, some classical constraint satisfaction problem, like 3 sad or something like that. So there's some function f that's defined over n-bit strings, and you're trying to minimize that function over all n-bit strings. Classic kind of NP-hard problem. Um, and one thing you could do in that case is you could do adiabatic evolution. So you could start with this all spins pointing to the right, and then you could start with a Hamiltonian of sum of sigma x's, and then you could gradually evolve to a Hamiltonian where um, the, the objective function f is along the diagonal of the matrix. That's what this notation diagonal of f means. And what QAOA does is it says, well, adiabatic is one thing you can do with these two Hamiltonians, but why don't we just search over all possible things we can do with them? So search over strategies where you apply one Hamiltonian, then you pulse the other Hamiltonian, and you go back and forth. Uh, and if you take enough iterations that includes approximating adiabatic as one of your possibilities, but there's no reason you're stuck with that. For the same quantum resources, you could search over many possibilities. Um, another thing in this, in this class is maybe your objective function is a quantum Hamiltonian. So you have some quantum Hamiltonian for like a molecule or a many-body system, uh, and you'd like to find the ground state energy of it. And one thing that often happens with these Hamiltonians is the Hamiltonian overall is hard to solve, but you can easily break it into pieces where each piece individually is easy to solve. So let's say you can write it as H0 plus H1. There might be more pieces, but you, you get the idea. Um, for example, in a lot of physical systems, you might have a kinetic energy term T and a potential energy term V, both of which are easy to solve individually, but they're hard when you put them together. And again, your ONCOTS could alternate between these two, uh, and that sort of generalizes adiabatic evolution to, um, you know, to give you a family you can search over. So these are two, this, this is a, a very plausible heuristic for a lot of problems. Uh, and like a lot of heuristics, you know, sometimes they'll do well, sometimes not so well. And it's very attractive because you can, whatever the size of your quantum computer is, you can just try it. And so it's a good way of, of getting started with near-term devices. Um, and how does it work as a classical algorithm? Well, here's what the algorithm looks like. There's a classical outer loop that does some kind of search over these parameters, T1 through TP. And then for each value of the parameter, it's the quantum computer's job to do the thing in the blue rectangle where they evaluate the cost function for that given value of T. Okay, so the, that's how it's a, a hybrid algorithm. And the classical computer's job is, you know, the classical computer is not sweating too much, but it's doing things that would be hard for a quantum computer to do. Like keep track of a bunch of parameters using and, and do arithmetic over them and not have them decode here. Um, and P is something where that the higher you take P, the more expressive your onsat will be, the more work you'll have to do. But it's even an interesting algorithm, even if P is relatively small. Um, so there's a lot of interesting design freedom in, in this algorithm, or you know, this, this family of algorithms, rather. And one of them that I've looked at a little bit and I think has a lot of room still to explore is, are you looking at the function or are you going to look at its gradient? So this is called um, zeroth order or first order or second order methods, depending on whether you're looking at the function or its first derivative or its second derivative and so on. And so you can think of this F, capital F of T, as the objective function. You know, you're trying to minimize this at, over, over T. And the zeroth order method, the job of the quantum computer is just to give you a noisy estimate of F of T. It has to be noisy, unfortunately, because you know, the quantum computer returns samples. 
And you could repeat the quantum computer a million times to, 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 get, to get it to be more accurate, but that's not necessarily the most productive way to use it. Uh, and within zeroth order, there, there are many, many different strategies. Um, in, gen in general, these are called gradient-free methods, like uh, Nelder Mead, or there's trust region methods, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of different possibilities. Um, of course, you could also use these noisy estimates to estimate the gradient by just evaluating it at two nearby values of t. Uh, and then you could use that to do gradient descent, but that also might not be your best strategy. Another thing you could do is have the quantum computer return you an estimate of the gradient. Uh, and then the classical computer is making use of that gradient information. And here, there are different tools, like stochastic gradient descent uh, is one. If you change the metric, there's something called stochastic mirror descent. If you try to have some estimate of the uh, second derivatives, and there's something called quasi-Newton methods. Um, I don't want to get into the details. I just want to emphasize that there are a range of choices, a lot of things that theory can only tell us so much about and you just have to try out. So a lot of interesting things for you guys to, to dig into. And one thing that hasn't been looked at so much are second order methods. Again, the quantum computer could estimate second derivatives and the classical computer could make use of those. Um, here, there's some more things to work out like numerical instability, uh, but there's no reason why, the, why those couldn't be solved. So there are a lot of possibilities here which have been incompletely um, studied. Let me say a little bit about how a quantum computer measures a gradient. So, Again, here are the onsets. Suppose I want to take the derivative of this objective function with respect to one of these parameters. Uh, then you can just work it out, and there's a formula for it that looks like the imaginary part of this, uh, of this expression. Here, when I write u1 colon j, I mean do the first j of these pulses. And then here, do the pulses j plus 1 up to p, and so on. So you do some of the pulses, then you do aj, and then you do the rest of them. Um, and here we have these terms aj and h that are not unitary, but you can, you can write them as a linear combination of polys, and so you can write everything as a linear combination of unitaries. This can be evaluated on a quantum computer. Uh, and here it opens up uh, some more design choices. So what you end up with is you get the thing you want is a linear combination here, these, uh, these gammas are just scalars, real, uh, in fact, non-negative numbers, uh, of expectations of a bunch of unitary matrices, each one of which you can do efficiently, but you have a whole bunch of them. Uh, and so now you have a choice of how much time do you want your quantum computer to spend on each one of these. And this gets into something called importance sampling, when there are many things that you can get noisy estimates of, and you have a choice of how you spend your time uh, and again, there's there interesting uh, room for optimization there. One thing that's attractive about this is that the coherence time in the quantum computer is almost the same as what you need for zeroth order estimation. You might need many repetitions, but the current quantum computers we have, the, you can repeat them many, many times, but each run of the quantum computer is only for a short amount of time. So uh, in a situation like that, you might want to do uh, an algorithm that involves a lot of repetition of something short. If you did have more time in qubits, you could do a lot better. There's this gradient estimation algorithm due to Stephen Jordan, um, which led more to this more recent work by Gillian Arunachalam and, and Levy, that um, basically for the same amount of effort as zeroth order estimation, you simply get the entire vector. Uh, the problem is it does cost a lot more qubits, so it's, it's less attractive for a, a near-term machine. Um, Okay, so you can get gradients, and then what happens? Uh, so here it gets interesting because you get different performance guarantees for these different algorithms. And there are a bunch of formulas which I don't really want to go through. I just want to mention, you know, you have zeroth order methods, different first order ones like stochastic gradient descent or stochastic mirror descent. Uh, you can use, these methods are different if you have something called strong convexity which is basically a statement about the, sta the shape of the solution landscape. And there are a bunch of different bounds that depend on different features of the problem geometry. Uh, so if you're close to the optimum in the L2 norm, or if you're close in the L1 norm, uh, and 
you know, how the landscape curves, you know, the local minimum. So all these things can, can affect the performance in different ways. Uh, and so I, I am kind of like a broken record here. You know, again, this is a, this is a good place to, to try things out and, and to see empirically how these different methods do. One thing that we found in our paper, theoretically, is we do have an example, very simple example, just a sum of, of single qubit terms, where first order methods are asymptotically better than zeroth order. Um, we, have, we, can, we can prove this. And what I would take away from that is not that this is better in every example, but just, you know, it shows you should take first order seriously. You know, that you should, uh, you should not, not a, you know, you're, you might say, well, look, zeroth order is just simpler. I don't have to worry about all this important sampling and so on. This shows that at least in some natural cases, you need first order to, first order does way, way better. And so it suggests that, um, you know, in, in general, we should be looking at it. Um, and, you know, the nature of heuristics is that there's, it's not one size fits all. So, um, so that there's a lot of room for, for exploration. So uh, this is the first, all I want to say about this first task of variational algorithms, that basically there's a lot of room for optimization in the classical outer loop. And those, that includes making different demands of the quantum computer. Does the quantum computer tell you the function value or a gradient or a second derivative? Uh, how should it spend its time among the different terms of the, of the gradient, et cetera? All a lot of interesting design choice, which we've only begun to scratch the surface. Okay, so uh, yeah, let me move on to uh, algorithms involving a big data set. So I started off on this problem thinking about Grover's algorithm. Kind of conceptually beautiful, but actually bizarrely hard to use. So the uh, Grover's algorithm says, um, you know, sometimes described as database search, but it really is not that. What it says is, if I can compute a function s, and the truth table of that function, I can call that a string, x1 through xn. So essentially the function encodes, the truth table of the function encodes this string, x1 through xn. I can find a marked item, some i star, such that f of i star is equal to one. That's the task. Classically, if I evaluate the function at some point, I don't learn anything, I just have to keep evaluating, so I need order and time. Grover figured out on a quantum computer, I can do it in time scaling like root n, which is kind of amazing because it seems like you're not learning anything when you, when you query in the wrong place, but that's the nature of, of amplitudes and superposition. And since then, people have found these Grover-like speedups for all kinds of unstructured and, and semi-structured search problems. The issue is your input is presented to you in a funny way. You have to assume that you have an oracle, which means a subroutine, that given i can efficiently produce x sub i. This model is really great for theorists. It can give you provable speed up. Sometimes they're exponential. But you know, here's a, a data center. Um, this does not look like an oracle, right? I cannot query that data center in superposition. Um, and it's anyway not the right way of dealing with some large data center. Uh, if, if I did have data laid out like this, then I shouldn't be doing some kind of sequential search through it. I should, I should probably um, search it in parallel. Um, so one way around this is to posit a new kind of quantum hardware called quantum RAM that can be created in superposition, which is an interesting idea, but um, you know, normal quantum computers are already hard enough. I, I, I want to ask what I can do without without making more hardware demands. Um, so one thing you can do if, if you have a data set on a hard drive and you want to turn it into this quantum oracle, you can query the hard drive record by record and then do these conditional quantum gates. So if the index i is equal to one, add x1 to the second register. If it's two, add x2 to the second register and so on. So this works, it does the job. It fits a conventional hardware model where you have, you know, maybe a, a laptop connected to a big hard drive, and then the laptop reads the record, creates a series of pulses that it sends to the signal generator that go to the hard to the to the uh, sorry to the actual quantum computer. You don't need any kind of hypothetical quantum access to the hard drive. Right? It just fits the usual hardware model. Um, but 
there's this order n overhead, right? You see one query takes you order n gates. And so that's going to wipe out speed ups like Grover. So one way to get around this, as I mentioned, is to posit better hardware. Another way is, you know, just do what Peter Shore did and come up with some efficient F, like modular exponentiation, that is, one, efficient to do on a quantum computer, and two, encode some useful problem like factoring. Uh, you know, that's great when you can get that to work out, but it's, uh, you know, it's rare that the stars align that well. And plus, for machine learning problems, you wouldn't expect the data to have that much structure. So instead, another approach you can do is find ways to reduce the size of the data set um, for problems. And this works for problems like clustering, uh, Bayesian inference, and, uh, and saddle point optimization. So let me, let me say it a little more concretely. What I'm talking about, one problem where you can do this is maximum likelihood estimation. So you have a set of models, Y, and you have a data set, X, and you want to um, pick the best model, Y, where best means it maximizes the sum over all the data points of F of X, Y, maybe plus some prior, some, some regularizer, R of Y, that tells you a priori you prefer some models over others. You can think of S as being like the log of the probability of observing data point X given Y, um, in which case the sum of those would be the log of the probability of seeing the entire data set given the model. Um, but this could just be some abstract loss function. That, that would also work. Um, so can you Groverize this? You know, can you get a quadratic speed up? Mathematically, it seems plausible because you have a max over y and then a sum over x. And that's not exactly how I presented Grover, but basically max, taking a maximum and taking a sum are both things that you can get a quadratic, you know, Grover-like speed up for. Um, so in terms of the math equation, it seems like you should be able to, but the type of data is very different. X is an actual data set that lives on a hard drive. So you don't have Oracle access to it or superposition access. Um, And the set of models is different. That's, you might call that a synthetic data set. That's more like the truth table of a function. It might be, for a clustering problem, the locations of the cluster centers as well as the covariance matrices of those clusters. So that's something where I can have superposition access to, um, random access as well, um, and superposition queries are fine. So what that means is I can, grover, I can groverize the search over Y but not over X. And so in this model where there's a kind of the natural model of quantum computing, there's a classical controller, classical computer controlling a quantum computer, I can get a Grover speed up over Y, uh, but not over, over X. And uh, a natural question is, you know, can we do better? Can we reduce this dependence on X? Like, do we have to really pay the full price of the size of X? Um, and there are a few approaches to this. One that I, I want to talk about is approximating X with a, smaller, uh, with a smaller set. This is called a core set. So if X is some set of points, you can approximate it with a smaller set, X prime. And we say that X prime is a good core set if for all models Y, the true log likelihood, sum over X in the full data set of the F of X, Y, looks like the same sum over points just in X prime. And for a few different reasons, we'll need to add a weight, W of X to these points. First of all, there's just fewer terms on the right-hand side, uh, but also the nature of, of building these, if you do it with, there's actually another way that important sampling is used here, where maybe you wanna make sure you get points from each of these clusters, so you're more likely to pick them from the small clusters, then you want that to be reflected in the weight so that the right-hand side is an unbiased estimator of the left-hand side. Uh, I'm not getting into too much detail there because this is like classical machine learning stuff and I wanna focus on the, the relation to quantum. Um, but there are, yeah, there exists a lot of techniques for, for finding these core sets. And then that gives rise to a, a hybrid algorithm for machine learning that broadly speaking looks like this, big data set X, Classical computer crunches it and makes a smaller one X prime. The quantum computer uses it for its optimization. 
to produce model Y. And in a little more detail, one way you could do this is you could have the classical computer get a, a crude approximation of Y called Y prime, use that to construct important sampling weights, uh, and then use important sampling to sample this set X prime. Um, basically, I said if you want to make it more likely to draw points from the small cluster, how do you even know what the small cluster is? Well, one way you could do that is with a, a crude approximation to the cluster. And then that you can use to get the, uh, the core set from which you can use to make a better, a better cluster. Then what does the quantum computer do? Um, well, it could use Grover. And you know, this whole time I've been saying Grover, but the same principle applies to any quantum optimization algorithm. Grover, you know, the square root may not be enough. And there are heuristics that, that might do better, like quantum walks or the adiabatic algorithm or uh, the variational algorithm that I talked about in, in the first part of the talk. Whatever those are, it'll always be cheaper to evaluate them if the data set is smaller. So whatever they are, the inner loop of those is going to scale like the size of the data set. But now that's reduced to the size of X prime. So you end up with a cost, and I'll just use Grover for concreteness, but I'm, you know, keep in the back of your mind, you could replace it a cost that goes like the square root of the size of y times the size of x prime. And so this gives you a, a speed up for things like, like clustering, um, where here there's a provable speed up, I wouldn't say over any classical algorithm, but, but over the best known one. Um, so that's one approach that I think is, is interesting to evaluate. Um, but, you know, you could say as a, as a quantum algorithm designer, you want a more glorious role for the for the quantum computer. In this case, you could say, well, look, by the time you even turn on the quantum computer, you've done data reduction. That just means you didn't need all those data points. Um, something more interesting is if you can use the quantum computer interactively to interactively query the, uh, the, the data set. You know, go back and say, I want more data points that look like this. Um, so one example of how to do this is from Campbell and Broderick, uh, and this other paper gives you kind of a review of adaptive important sampling if you want other techniques. Um, and they consider not maximum likelihood, but a related problem of Bayesian inference, where you start with a prior pi naught and you want to sample from the posterior pi of y. The true posterior is updated by all of the data, but you might also use a core set for this. And the way it works is you can build up the core set iteratively, in round T, the classical computer sends the core set of size T along with the weights to the quantum computer. The quantum computer samples from the corresponding distribution, so it doesn't see the whole data set, it just sees these T points. And quantum computers can also get a, a quadratic speed up for this kind of, of sampling. And then the classical computer, and here it gets into the classical techniques I, I don't want to dwell on, uses the, the, the output of the quantum computer, y1, y2, through yt, to augment its core set, to choose one more point to add. And the thing that's interesting here is that they can try to pick a point that wasn't fit well by the previous models. And so that way, you can query parts of the data set um, that are informed by, by the model that the quantum computer has output so far. So let me give a concrete version of this for a, it's not exactly the same problem, it's closely related, it's called saddle point optimization. Um, I want to use X now to mean the convex hull of my data set, and Y, think of it as, uh, I want it to be probability distributions over M items. You can think of them as sort of M basic strategies, like basic models, and you want to allow any mixture of those strategies. And then the cost function F is going to be linear on X and Y. The problem you want to solve is a minimax problem. You want to find the best y that does well uh, over the worst possible x, the maximum over y, minimum over x of f of x, y. And because of the conditions I've given, you can reverse the order of the min of the max, and you get the same answer. So as I've written, it looks like a zero-sum game. Um, I'm a little short on time, so I, I won't explain all the other connections. But let me just mention, if instead I did max over y and then sum over x, this would look like those maximum likelihood things, right? I want to find the best Y that does well when I sum over X. So if you imagine a clustering problem where the, instead of looking at the average cost 
of you know how far a point is from its center, you look at the worst case point. That's kind of what this corresponds. And I'll describe an algorithm that's, that works well in the classical case due to Gregoriadis and Kachian. I'll illustrate it for rock, paper, scissors. So here's the payoff matrix for that. I've described Y's payoff, and X is just negative of that. Um, so the algorithm goes as follows. The X player will choose X1 arbitrarily, let's say rock, and that induces some payoffs for Y, zero for choosing rock, one for choosing paper, and so on. And then, instead of just doing a best response, if it was a best response, you can see that would just cycle forever. The best response would be paper, the best response to that would be scissors, and it would never converge. We'll introduce some randomness. We'll say, choose Y1, the Y strategy, to be something that's biased towards the better strategies for Y. So paper is more likely, scissors is less likely. And let's suppose this ends up with paper. Then we go back to X, and now Y's choice of paper induces some payoffs for X. And we'll do the same sampling. Now the X player wants to minimize, so there's a minus sign here. And so again, X, now X will choose randomly, say randomly chooses paper. Now we go back to Y, and now we respond to all of the strategies put together. So, you know, as when you, when you first start off, you're responding to one strategy, you're, you're almost uniformly random, but as you go on, the bad strategies will become exponentially less likely. And what Gregoriadis and Kachian showed is that after, the, uh, if you want to get error that's like epsilon times the largest entry of the matrix, the number of rounds you need goes like one over epsilon squared times the log of the number of strategies. So the scaling with, with epsilon is not great, but the scaling with the number of strategies is, is very good. And this works well on a hybrid machine because the number of rounds of alternation is not that bad. In each round, what happens? Well, the classical computer has to go through its whole data set, which you were kind of willing to do once anyway. And the quantum computer uses Grover or some other optimization algorithm um, with order T calculations in the inner loop. And you were, um, you know, this is, this is close to the minimum that you would, you would have done there anyway. Like you would have, um, you were hopefully willing to do Grover at least once. And so here the inner loop is, is not too much, you know, if, if T is not too big, then this is not too much worse than just doing uh, Grover once with, a, with an easy inner loop. Um, so I think this is also a good thing to look at for a hackathon. These are kind of theoretical ideas, but trying them with real data sets, I think would be, would be an interesting thing to look at. Okay, so let me, let me wrap up. I think I'm about out of time. Um, the first part of my talk was classical outer loops for variational algorithms. I think, you know, looking at the solution landscape and near local minima saddle points is interesting to look at. The second was hybrid algorithms and machine learning. And here's the paper there. Uh, finally, there's a paper that just appeared, which is not mine, but I wanted to flag on variational benchmarks, where they look, they propose a large number of, of sample problems to look at. And I think if you want to try something empirical with variational algorithms, uh, I think looking at this paper is, is probably a very good place to start for, um, yeah, just a, a, a good family of, of hard instances to look at. All right. Yeah, thanks for your attention. And uh, yeah, look forward to, to discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, this was a great talk, Aram. And uh, uh, everybody was asking a lot of questions on the chat. Uh, some people were wondering about the blackboard behind you and about the font you use in the slides. Um, yeah, I know I found the <laughs> adaptive course. It's very interesting. Um, something that hadn't come to mind, but the fact of being able to uh, modify your data set, like go back and forth, uh, that's mm -hmm. interesting. So uh, yeah. I don't know if you can tell us a few words about the Blackboard in your background. Well, it's just, yeah, what's been going on. It's just, um, Actually, that's another kind of adaptive quantum algorithm. We've been looking at adaptive Hamiltonian simulation, um, which, uh, yeah, hasn't quite worked yet, but we're 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 um, we're struggling with it. And actually, one um, one other thing we discussed there is this really cool paper um, by um, 
All right, it'll take me a second. I'll, I'll, I'll dig up the authors. Um, about, um, oh yeah, it's, it's by a group from NTT, Seiseki Akibue, Go Kato, and Seichiro Tani, about um, if you have, let's say you want to approximate a target unitary, and you have access to a bunch of unitaries you can do, um, then, you know, you might think, well, I should just pick the closest unitary to approximate my target. Um, and they find it's a lot better to choose a mixture of unitaries. Um, that basically, let's say I have a collection of unitaries that can, are within epsilon of any target, then it turns out there's a way of mixing them that gets within epsilon squared of any target, which is like, yeah, kind of mind blowing. That, that's another thing that's uh, sort of on the blackboard, but in, in too messy of a way for me to, yeah, to, to defend that, but their paper is very good. Uh, later on, if you're on the Discord, it would be great to get the link to that paper or the name sure. of the paper later in the Discord. Yeah. So everybody remember to go to the Discord and uh, uh, go to the chat and take a look at the links that we're going to share there and the name of the paper. So before we go on with the uh, audience questions, I want to ask you some different questions, right? And uh, mm -hmm. everybody remember after these questions, we're going to do a giveaway. So make sure to keep asking them. So first question for you is, I know that your face is on a novel. Uh, what is this novel and how does this happen? Yeah, so it's, the novel is called The Divine Comedy. But it's not the famous one. It's, a, it's another one of the same title. And um, yeah, it just happened because I have a friend who's a really good photographer. And he uh, yeah, had a great photo of me, which he put up on his webpage and the, and the publisher found it. Um, and uh, yeah, the novel just looks like I've, I've come out of a really harrowing experience. Um, uh, yeah, it doesn't really look like me, but it's, <laughs> it's uh, my whole family now has this book as a result. Um, and unfortunately, none of us like the book, but. Oh, no. You have to, have to yeah. That was my next question if you recommended the book or not, but I guess you've answered it already. Well, the cover is great. <laughs> <laughs> so get a picture of the book, but not necessarily right. the book right. itself. Okay. That's right. Interesting. Um, there's another question. You mentioned you're a huge fan of relative entropy. So maybe in two or three words, can you tell us something about this? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it, um, it did take a step backwards it, it, with... Um, there was this, this old paper of Brandau and Plenio that seemed to show that, um, let's say you have some set of free resources like separable states with no entanglement, and then you can measure the, um, I think I'm diving too, too fast into the weeds. Basically, it's, relative entropy is a distance measure that turned out to be just a lot more interesting than trace distance. Um, Trace distance is sort of like it just only goes up to one and then it stops. And relative entropy, um, yeah, wow, I'm really not explaining this well. It just ex expresses, it's, uh, it's a much more expressible, it, it has more dynamic range and, and tells, you, tells you a lot more. I guess one way that's particularly interesting is when you have some class of simple states and the relative entropy measures your distance from that class of simple states. And what's great about it is just in how many settings that, that appears. So if you have the relative entropy with respect to the closest product state, then that's the mutual information. And if you have the relative entropy with respect to the thermal state, then that's the free energy. And uh, we all, people thought the relative entropy with respect to separable states would tell you something useful, and, and that turned out to be a little bit messy. Um, if you have the relative entropy with respect to um, the maximum mix state, that tells you about your entropy. So it's, it's just sort of like this one thing appears in so many different settings. Uh, yeah, it's just if there's one, it, it just keeps it, yeah, it just keeps on being full of surprises, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, and actually a little bit related to my talk. So, you know, in this Gregoriatis Kachian paper, you need only longer than make many rounds to converge. 
And you can actually connect the two parts of my talk. If you view, like, if you think about gradient descent, gradient descent usually is making, when you talk about how it makes progress, you often talk about it in terms of the, the L2 norm, like the Euclidean norm. But if you measure progress with respect to the relative entropy, and then you, you get to this slightly different kind called mirror descent, uh, the number of steps you need is, can be exponentially smaller. So instead of scaling with the dimension, it goes like log of the dimension. Um, and that's just from using relative entropy as your metric instead of using the Euclidean norm. So yeah, it just keeps showing up over and over again in, in different magical ways. Uh, so no one, no one thing, but um, yeah, overall, I, I do like it a lot. Definitely something for people to explore and learn about, and maybe even yeah. trying it out. Uh, uh, Penny Lane has a quantum information module, so if somebody's interested, you can take a look at the functions there, or if you want to contribute a demo, if you actually do know about the topic and you want to share this information with other people, that would be awesome as well. So a topic to take a look at, learn more, and share more about it too. Uh, now we're going to go on with some questions uh, from the chat. So then Tucky Kirby asks, on the efficient gradient measurement slide, are there Monte Carlo algorithms specific for estimating the gradient? Yeah, so um, well, I guess Can I get a clarification? Do you mean classical Monte Carlo, or um, yeah? Can you say a little bit more about uh, a little more about the question? Yeah, we'll get some more clarification. Talk, you said real time, right? uh, oh yeah, they say classical. Well, if you look at this expression, you know this is a this is an equality. So, if you're getting the gradient, really means just learning about like evaluating this expression. And this is not exactly the same as estimating the energy, but it kind of has a similar difficulty. And so whether you can do this classically depends on your onsage, but if you have an interesting onsage that, that justifies the use of a quantum computer, then um, then there shouldn't be a good classical Monte Carlo way of doing it, right? It, like if there were a classical Monte Carlo way, then then you can just do the whole thing classically and, and never turn on the quantum computer. Um, but if you look at what's going on here, you have your initial state, you do all the unitaries, you do the Hamiltonian, you undo some of the unitaries, you add in this other simple gate, the AJ, and then you undo the rest of the, ham of the unitaries. That kind of looks pretty close to just doing the whole to just estimating the energy. So I would say most of the time, there, you would not expect there to be a classical Monte Carlo algorithm. But that said, the way this works is you're, you have to compute an expectation value of a linear combination of operators. The quantum computer will just do one of these operators at a time. And so then, and the quantum computer, of course, gives you a probabilistic answer. So combining them, you know, like the overall thing involves some randomness that, and that, you know, as I was saying before, it gives you some interesting uh, design freedom. Yeah, nice. We can go to another question. So this one from YQCAT. Are there any intuitions on which method works better for what kinds of Hamiltonians or problems? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, when you are moving in parameter space, is the right, does the right metric look like the L2 norm, like the Euclidean norm, or the L1 norm, like the sum of the absolute values of the entries? Um, if it looks like the L2 norm, then maybe regular stochastic gradient descent is better. If it looks like L1, then mirror descent might be better. That's based on theoretical bounds. Um, yeah, but the short answer is we just don't know and you just have to try it. And theory can give you some hints. Um, but this is, yeah, this is an area where people have begun to scratch the surface. Um, and, and there's, I think, a lot of room for, 
hopefully people in the audience to, to make more progress. Yes, great motivation. Uh, the next question is by Moritz Wu. Uh, mm -hmm. It's more like a more like a statement. So core set generation looks a lot like K memes. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, it looks like K memes in that you are to make the core set. I said you'd like order one samples from each cluster. So then it looks like finding the clusters in the first place. Um, so in that sense, it sounds a little bit circular, like you have to solve the clustering problem in order to get the core set, in order to solve the clustering problem. Um, but the way to, to get around that is the core set generation could be from a very lousy approximation of the best clustering. And then after you have the core set, you could use it to find a really good clustering. And why, so how does the quality of the initial clustering matter? Basically, that only affects the size of your core set. So that like the longer, so if you make a, if you do a bad job with the initial clustering, you'll have to have a bigger core set. And so the second phase of your algorithm will have to run for longer, but it won't affect the final quality. It'll just affect the final runtime. And to do that initial crude approximation, uh, definitely k-means is, a, um, is a, a reasonable way of doing that. So that, that may be what you had in mind with, with the, the uh, question slash statement, but um, yeah, if, hopefully, hopefully that's useful. If not, for more to, uh, you can always uh, explain more in Discord and later get an answer. Is uh, the Discord, Discord chat, should there be like a, a Discord session for my talk or will that be? you will have like a, a specific channel where you can answer questions uh, specifically okay. for you. Great. Yes. Um, okay, the next and last question, uh, Dramian asks, this adaptive method would require a high speed feedback between the classical computer and the quantum computer to perform better than pure classical, right? Definitely. Um, but I think that's kind of inevitable anyway, because, um, well, actually, this is a little tricky. So, um, yeah, so it, it's, a good, it's a good question. Like, in, in what sense is, is the hardware really capable of this? Um, so one, and the, there are some types of hardware that do not support this but not for any very deep reason, just because we're using off the, the experimental labs are using off the shelf electronics that are good at some things and not good at others. And sometimes what happens is you have your pulse generator, it's really slow to load new pulses into it. Not because you know, we're not capable of transferring data, but they, they didn't build it for that. Like they built it for something where you would only change the pulses every now and then. And so that could lead to a long delay if that just happens to be the type of hardware that you have. But there's other ones where maybe you can slowly put in a, a menu of pulses, like here's an X pulse in you know, ex super high precision. And then when I load in an, a program, it's just selecting from this menu, that's, that's a relatively small amount of data that's quick to load onto this. So that really depends on the experimental setup, but there's no in principle reason why you couldn't quickly change the program. And I kind of don't know exactly when, which platforms have implemented it in a way that makes it easier or hard to do that, but I think it's pretty common that you can change the program quickly from, from run to run. Furthermore, if we're ever gonna go to fault tolerant quantum computing, we're gonna need even more adaptivity. Right. We're going to need to make intermediate measurements and then, you know, tens of nanoseconds later for superconductors or microseconds, milliseconds later for ion traps, like quick, pretty quickly feed the results back into to more pulses later on. So what I'm asking for is not even as bad as the adaptivity you'll need for fault tolerance. But it's true that not all platforms are capable of the kind of adaptivity that, that I was asking for. Good point. 
Yeah, so it's good to take into account the hardware as well and not only the softwares because they all have their limitations. Thank you so much, Aram. Everybody else, stay here. Don't go. But we will have to say goodbye to Aram for now. So thank you for coming. And we'll see you in the Discord. Everybody, make sure to ask your questions there. Okay. Thank Thanks, you, Aram. Thanks, Love your talk.